I want to welcome you all to the fifth installment of the ASNIC University interview series entitled uh, Systematic Interpretation of a Pet Stress Study, Nuts and Bolts. I'm Jamie Bork from the University of Virginia, and I am joined by my mod co-moderator, Krishna Patel, uh, who is on faculty at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. And we're extremely pleased to have with us today, Dr. Sharmila Dorbala, who is the Director of Nuclear Cardiology at Brigham and Women's Hospital and a Professor of Radiology at Harvard Medical School. She's also past president of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology, and she is going to be our featured speaker. Sharmila, thank you so much for joining us, and I uh, thought maybe you could make some opening remarks. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Krishna. Really honored to be part of this program here. Positron emission tomography really is a powerful technique that provides exceptionally high quality images in a short time with low radiation dose. More importantly, we are able to quantify absolutely radio traces in absolute terms, allowing us to quantify myocardial blood flow in ml per gram tissue per, per minute. Beyond the scope of this talk, we also have several molecularly targeted radio traces which can image minute molecular processes in the cardiovascular system, which includes you know, myocardial innovation, amyloid, oxidative metabolism, and so on and so forth. So all in all, this technique is a powerful technique that provides information on myocardial perfusion imaging, as well as cardiovascular imaging beyond perfusion. Thank you. And just thinking about perfusion imaging, I was uh, thinking that perhaps you could sort of quickly walk us through your systematic approach to interpreting a PET study. Yeah, that's a good question. I think systematic interpretation of imaging is always important to provide accurate uh, interpretation and report to the different providers. As we expect imaging, we have to be systematic when we review these images. So what do I do when I read these scans and when we read it with our fellows here? So the first thing we do as we expect is reorient the images, make sure the stress and uh, rest images look similar, look at the image quality, make sure that they're uh, count rich images. Then we go ahead and uh, look at the registration of the transmission and emission images to make sure that they're appropriately co-registered. Once these steps are done, then we go ahead and start looking at our static images. We align the images, rest and stress, um, look at the polar plots, gated images, look at the CT scan for ancillary findings, calcium score, and finally interpret uh, myocardial blood flow. So once all the pieces of information is reviewed, then we put it together and try to understand if the test provides answers for the clinical question that's raised. That's fantastic, Dr. Dorbala. I was wondering if you can uh, uh, just elaborate on how this approach, uh, when you read a PET perfusion study, would differ from uh, how you would read a SPECT perfusion study. Yeah, that's a good question. So SPECT and PET are similar in many ways, but are also somewhat different. Um, the one of the first things that comes to mind for me is with SPECT, we look at the rotating projection data to identify motion. With PET, we don't have that. So what we use instead is look at the multiple frames of the dynamic acquisition and play it in a cine loop to detect patient motion. So that's one difference. Then with SPECT, we look at gated imaging, which is typically post-stress gated imaging, whereas with PET, it is gated imaging during peak stress, whether it's vasodilator or dobutamine, it's gating during maximal hyperemia. Then the other um, difference is with SPEC, we always look at these so-called normal variants, anterior wall attenuation in women, inferior wall attenuation in men. With PET, the imaging is always performed with attenuation correction. The homogeneous radio tracer is expected throughout the myocardium. Of course, you have some normal variants, such as apical thinning. You have this fixed basal lateral defect with N13 ammonia. Sometimes you have blood pool activity with rubidium. Um, 
But you know, keeping all those aside, you expect a nice homogeneous perfusion. Um, and the only type of attenuation artifacts that you may see would be when there's misregistration between your emission and transmission. So that is something that we have to be careful about. Uh, beyond that, um, the additional piece that we get with PET is flow quantitation. So with SPECT, we are primarily looking at static gated polar plots. With PET, we are in addition looking at quantitative myocardial blood flow, and we're looking at the CT for calcium as well as for ancillary findings. And along those lines, Sharmila, you had mentioned, and, and one of the big advantages to PET is the ability to have that additional information, including the coronary calcium score, the quantitative myocardial blood flow, the LVEF reserve from having a, a true stress EF. Um, certainly, all those pieces of information have to be uh, incorp incorporated into your interpretation. And I was wondering sort of what approach you use to sort of do that. Yeah, it's um, an excellent point, Jamie. And this is important both for SPECT and for PET, obviously. We need to integrate all the information from static, gated flow, coronary calcium, and then patient history and ECG changes during the stress test. When the perfusion scan is severely abnormal, usually we don't find these additional measures particularly helpful because you have your answer. The perfusion is severely abnormal and you have your answer. But when the perfusion is mildly abnormal, or normal, and then these parameters may help. So let's say you have a patient where the scan is mildly abnormal, but you look at the EF that's reduced at rest, that by itself is a high-risk marker. But then now you see a patient where the EF goes down further with stress, with vasodilator stress. Um, we and others have shown that this may be a marker of underlying multi-vessel uh, obstructive coronary disease, including left main disease. So that is a case where I think um, an EF reserve that is um, zero or negative may suggest that your perfusion is showing small ischemia, but there may be a greater amount of obstructive CAD in that particular patient. Now, what about um, Calcium score. I think that's a very important piece of information. We always look at calcium on the attenuation correction CT scan or on the calcium score, gated calcium score CT scan. Again, this is particularly helpful when the scan is normal. When the scan is normal and the calcium score is severely abnormal, then that is an area where you are concerned that the patient has calcified atherosclerosis the perfusion looks normal. The question is, what does the flow show? Is the flow normal or abnormal? Believe it or not, you do have instances where you may have extensive calcium, but your perfusion and myocardial blood flow are totally normal. So the patient's uh, microcirculation has adjusted to atherosclerosis and there is sufficient vasodilator reserve. So I think each piece of information is extremely helpful. Now, if you have a patient where your calcium score is abnormal and your flow is severely abnormal, that is when then you start worrying that this patient may have more disease than is apparent on the static images alone. So there are many scenarios. I think it's going to be hard for us to go into each scenario, but suffice it to say, look at static, but try to understand what the other pieces of information are adding in any given case. I think that's a, a great point. And, and just thinking, I find the calcium score can be really helpful when uh, looking at a set of images and you might be worried about uh, three vessel disease in a patient. And then you look and the coronary calcium score is zero or, or close to zero, then it certainly gives you a little bit of added confidence that, that maybe the uh, disease was not as extensive as you might have otherwise thought. Yeah, and also we look at the calcium score for making decisions about next steps in management. So, for example, if a patient has extensive coronary calcification, then that patient may not be an ideal candidate for a CT-based coronary angiogram to define coronary anatomy or vice versa if there's no calcium, then that patient may be a great candidate for a CT-based angiogram for further uh, characterization.
No, that those are all uh, very important points. Uh, I just wanted to bring up another thing that the fellows ask us all the time. You know, oftentimes we see where the relative perfusion images and the uh, flow quantitation um, results are discordant. Um, and, and you touched upon that a little bit. What is, uh, how would you uh, handle discordant results uh, between perfusion as well as flow when you're reporting it out and how do you reconcile uh, this discordance? Yeah, again, uh, very important to look at all pieces of information. And I think when the results are concordant, as you point out, uh, the decisions are somewhat easy, both severely abnormal, both totally normal. I think decisions are easy. When we see perfusion defects and the flow is normal, I think that discordance is somewhat easy as well, which is, we say this is likely branch vessel disease, which is not impacting flow. Uh, and, you know, that is fine. The really nuanced interpretation comes in where there's discordance with normal perfusion images and low absolute myocardial blood flow. And I think that is where we need to look at what does this mean? Does this mean microvascular dysfunction? Does this mean balanced ischemia with multivessel obstructive disease? But before we even conclude that, we need to make sure this is not an artifactually low flow, right? Let's make sure that the patient has not consumed coffee, the patient is not a vasodilator non-responder. But these are very challenging decisions on a clinical basis. We can ask the patient if they consume coffee, but how do you determine vasodilator non-responsiveness? I think that's um, very challenging. So that is when we look at ejection fraction reserve, resting ejection fraction, and um, perfusion defects, for example. If there's a perfusion defect and flows that's reversible with severely reduced flows everywhere, I'm much more confident that the vasodilator response was achieved because there's a reversible perfusion defect and the low flows represent indeed severe microvascular disease or and or obstructive multivessel coronary disease. So the challenge becomes when the perfusion is normal, but the flows are reduced. So what do we do in these cases? So in these cases, obviously, there's no cutoff flow value below which we could say this is obstructive coronary disease or this is microvascular dysfunction. So in these instances, this is what I was alluding to earlier about using the CT for CT angiography, you need anatomic information. So this is where we might sometimes say, let's consider a CT-based coronary angiogram. And if that shows no obstructive coronary disease, then the low flow represents microvascular dysfunction or one of these other factors, but doesn't represent balanced ischemia. Then um, what else could we do if there's a lot of calcium and then CT is not, a pro not an option, we might rarely consider a repeat PET with dobutamine. I sometimes even order a dobutamine echo because the question, if the question is balanced ischemia, if you do a dobutamine echo, you should see PID, you should see wall motion abnormalities or a stress MR study. Very rare instances, but sometimes we have to go that route, uh, looking at an additional test to further decipher the low flows in the context of a completely normal perfusion. Shamila, in the in the context of a lot of the interpretations you've been talking about, there are inherent levels of of risk that are present, and one challenge comes up in in terms of how one um, uh, communicates levels of risk to the referring clinician. I was wondering if you could talk about what your approach is to um, providing risk statements. Uh, in in your reports for PET studies and, and whether you provide a routine um, uh, comment on risk in every report or if you only address it in certain studies? Yeah, um, thanks, Jamie. Really, again, a very practical question on what to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So the first response would be we don't routinely give a risk statement on every report. Now, where do we give a risk statement? Um, when the scan is low risk, 
can everything looks normal and the flows augment well with the dilation you have a high flow reserve peak stress is normal everything is normal um then we sometimes can provide a statement saying all these findings together suggest low risk um findings at the other end also i do provide a risk statement when it's a high risk scan with multiple high risk features reversible perfusion defects low ejection fraction high calcium and then a very low flow reserve with low peak stress flow sometimes not sometimes a lot of times we'll call the physician first discuss the findings and then put in the report that these findings were discussed with the clinician and these findings do suggest multivessel obstructive coronary disease we wouldn't directly say it's high risk but say suggest underlying uh, multivessel coronary obstructive disease or high risk findings on this the intermediate zone is where i don't think i have a good answer on how to give a risk statement anywhere in between so that's where we don't have a good answer thank you Uh, the other thing that comes up very often sharmila is uh, tid the fellows are very familiar with the concept of tid because uh, they use it very frequently when they interpret spect uh, in terms of interpreting transient ischemic dilation or tid on pet versus spect um, are the cut off similar how how would how does your uh, interpretation differ when you see it on a pet study versus a spect study Yeah, again, another very practical um, but somewhat challenging question, and I'll tell you why. So we always, when we look at the LV size, we say, you know, what is the LV size at rest? What is its stress? Is there transient cavity dilation, or is there fixed cavity dilation? So the determination of TID typically is made visually and then confirmed by the TID ratio. and before we interpret these ratios what we what i strongly recommend is to look at the contours of the myocardial tracing and make sure that the contours are appropriately tracking the endocardial uh, borders so once all of that is done then you can look at your tid ratio provided by the software now the cutoffs can vary by the tracer so rubidium versus ammonia they can also vary by whether or not you're using equal amount of radio tracer rest versus stress uh, or if you're doing a low dose rest followed by a high dose stress as um, with n13 ammonia we use that protocol for some time so because of all these parameters that can affect tid values i think it's hard to come up with a single number and i don't know if the numbers are different from fact hmm, so what number do we use typically we need to visually see tid and if the tid ratio is more than 1.13 or something like that then we would call it uh, abnormal so shamil i think we have time for one last question and i'll i'll just bring up i'm um, sure you were uh, as excited as i was to see the promising results from the phase 3 trial on f18 flupiridaz a potential new perfusion agent uh, to add to our armamentarium um expected to uh, receive FDA approval in the near future and i was wondering if there were any unique considerations that this tracer provides um and and how it, if there's anything different about how you would interpret those studies yeah this is uh, actually very exciting news for the field we've all been long waiting for fluperidas uh, it has a 2 hour half life once approved the hope is it can be um sent as unit doses to sites that don't have a generator or a cyclotron making pet much more accessible much more widely available interpretation of fluperidas is very similar to interpretation of rubidium or ammonia um i read scans for fluperidas for one of the clinical trials and the images are exceptionally high quality I did not see any typical artifacts apical thinning is something that comes across as with other tracers but otherwise uh, image quality is excellent for the static gated flow values are excellent because the extraction characteristics of fluperidas is really good even higher than n13 ammonia so we are all um, really looking forward i think the learning curve will be very small 
this was uh, this was amazing this was fantastic i think we're almost at the end of our time i want to thank dr durbala thank you so much for spending time and sharing your expertise with us uh, expertise with us i certainly learned a lot and i hope our audience also finds it uh, very valuable uh, for the audience um, thank you for joining us and watching this interview and please uh, don't forget to tune in for the next session um, which is on microvascular disease in women uh, where Dr. Rene Bullock Palmer and Madison Kohar uh, interview Dr. Panithya Chari on Thai TV uh, on this topic. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you. Thank you, Shamila.